On this special build edition of the AI Show, we'll get to hear from Scott Lumberg, senior researcher on the Microsoft research team. It is definitely important to debug and explain your machine learning models. In this video, Scott will explain the science behind SHAP values and how they can be used to explain and debug your models. Make sure you tune in. Hi, my name is Scott Lundberg. I'm a senior researcher here at Microsoft Research AI, and I look forward today to uh, diving into the background behind SHAP, which is a, a tool and research designed to use Shapley values from game theory to explain machine learning models. So to understand how this works, let's start with a model that we're going to explain. Uh, this model, let's imagine, works at a bank uh, and takes information about customers like John and outputs predictions about their likelihood of having repayment problems if the bank were to give them a loan. Um, in this case, the repayment problem is a bit high, so the bank's unlikely to give them a loan. And as a data scientist responsible for building this model, you may have used a whole variety of different packages in the model development process, anything from scikit-learn or linear models or trees, uh, grading boosted decision stuff, deep networks, uh, all in pursuit of producing a, a good, accurate, high-quality model. But in that process, a lot of these things are very complicated and very opaque, which means you need, to, in order to debug these things, you need to be able to interpret them. Okay, so that's one huge motivation for interpretability and explainability is the ability to debug and understand your model. It's not just for the data scientists, though. It's also for customers. Uh, there's even legal requirements in the finance domain. But in many areas, you need to be able to communicate to a customer uh, why a model is making decision about them. And also for businesses who depend on these models, uh, understanding how they work and hence when they can break uh, is extremely important uh, in order to manage the risk that is taken in these businesses for models. All of these motivate how important it is to have interpretability and explainability. So how does SHAP help with this? Well, if we go back to John, it's important to understand that Whenever a model makes a prediction, it's always got some prior in mind, uh, you know, in the sense that there's always some base rate that we would have predicted if we knew nothing about John, right? In this case, it could be our average over the training data set of defaults, or it could be uh, some test data set that we have in mind, or some particular group of people, like all the people who got accepted. Whatever that background prior knowledge is, um, that's actually kind of where we start when we don't know anything about a, a prediction. But John didn't get predicted the base rate, which in this case was 16% of our data set. That's just the expected value of the model's output. He got predicted 22%. So what SHAP does is it says, hey, look, we need to explain uh, not 22% from zero, because zero is just an arbitrary number. What we need to explain is how we got from the base rate, where we knew nothing about John, to the current prediction for John, which is 22%. And how do we go about doing this? Well, essentially, we can look at this expectation of the model's prediction over our training data set in this case. And then we can fill out John's application one, uh, one field at a time. In this case, we're filling out that his income is not verified. Now, what that does is it bumps up the expected value of the model by 2.2%. So we could say, ah, that 2.2% must uh, be attributable to the fact that John didn't have his income verified. So relative to people in the training data set, this increases his risk. If we do the same thing for his debt to income ratio, we see that that is at 30, which bumps him up to 21%. And then we see that he had a delinquent payment 10 months ago, which further increases his risk up to 22.5%. Again, we're filling out his application one entry at a time. And then we fill out the fact that he had no recent account openings. And this drops his risk significantly because uh, not applying for credit is a good sign. But then uh, the, finally, we fill in the fact that he has 46 years of credit history, which you would think would be a really good thing. But ironically, in this case, it turns out that that hurts him significantly and bumps his risk up to 22%. So now what we've done is we've filled out his entire application and we've arrived at the prediction of the model. But we've done it piece by piece so that we can attribute each piece to each feature and hence explain how we got from when we knew nothing about John uh, to the model's final prediction. Now, let's back up and see how this works for a simple model, a simple linear regression model from scikit-learn, for example. So here's a model trained on um, this lending data set where it's a linear model, and I'm showing you a straight line that represents the partial dependence plot of that linear model. Okay? And what we can see 
Also on the on X axis, we have uh, the feature I'm explaining, which in this case happens to be annual income. And then on the Y axis, we just have the, uh, the, the axis for a partial dependence plot, which happens to be the expected value of that model's output when we change one feature, which for a linear model is a straight line. And what I wanna highlight here is how easy it is for a linear model to read off the shot value right from a partial dependence plot. So the gray line here is just the average output of the model. That's the prior base rate we were talking about. And then what we can see is that the shot value is just the difference between that average and the partial dependence plot for the value of the feature we're interested in. Okay, for a linear model, we can simply look and say, ah, John has made $140,000. That puts his partial dependence plot at a certain point. And then we can just measure that height from the mean value, which if it's higher than the average, it's gonna be positive. If it's lower than the average, it's gonna be negative. We can do the exact same thing for more complicated models like generalized additive models, such as what are in, uh, in the EBM package. Uh, what happens there is now you don't have a straight line anymore. You can have a much more flexible uh, partial dependence plot. But again, the shap values, because there's no interaction effects going on, we still have an additive model. The shap values are again, just exactly the difference between the height of the partial dependence plot and the expected value of the model. Okay, so if you were to plot the shot values for many, many, many different uh, individuals, you would get a, uh, essentially a line, and that line would be exactly the, the mean centered partial dependence plot. So more complicated models, though, are, of course, where people are most interested in this kind of stuff. And in that case, you can't just use a single order. You can't just introduce features one at a time, because it turns out that the orders you introduce features matters. Uh, if there's an AND function or an OR function, the first or second one you introduce will get all the credit. So here's an example on a real data set where we say no recent account openings in 46 years of credit history. We filled out account openings first and then credit history. What if in filling out his application, we first filled out credit history and then account openings? Turns out it makes a huge difference. What that means is there's a strong interaction effect between credit history and account openings. And that's um, where SHAP comes in to try and fairly distribute the effects that are going on in sort of high level interactions. You could say, how on earth are we gonna do this? Well, it turns out we can go back into the 1950s and rely on some very solid theory and game theory uh, that is all about how to do this fairly. Okay, in complicated games with lots of interacting players that have high order interaction effects, uh, how can we share those interaction effects fairly among all of the players uh, such that a, a set of basic axioms are satisfied? And it turns out uh, there's only one way to do it, and uh, it came from values that are now called the Shapley values after Lloyd Shapley. Um, Lloyd Shapley's done a lot of great work in game theory and allocation and things like this and actually got a Nobel Prize in 2012. So this is based on some solid math. So going back to our data scientist, we can say, oh, okay, that's great. Uh, I'm really convinced by this. I think I should use these values. How do I compute them? Well, it turns out that result from averaging, just what we talked about before, using a single ordering, but we have to do it over all orderings. Of course, that's computationally intractable, and it's even worse because it's NP-hard, if you know what that means. And um, so that's where the real challenge of these problem, uh, these values lie, is how to compute these things efficiently. Uh, I'm not going to go into the algorithms that allow us to do that, but that's at the heart of what is in the SHAP package and the research behind it. Um, it is designed to enable us to compute these very uh, well-justified values efficiently and effectively uh, on real data sets. And if we do that for XGBoost, we can actually solve it in polynomial time very quickly, exactly. And now we see that the shot values no longer exactly match the partial dependence plot because they're accounting for these interaction effects. Because okay? when you look at a partial dependence plot, you're losing all the high order interacting information about ands and ors that your model may be doing. Uh, but the shot values account for that and then uh, drop that credit down onto each feature. So you'll see vertical dispersion uh, when you plot many, many people's shot values for a feature. So let's do this for a particular feature to dive into this credit history. Because remember, it was a bit surprising that credit history hurt um, John's credit score. So if we plot credit history versus the shot value for that credit history, we get a dot for every person. Again, a little bit of vertical dispersion from the interaction effects. And then if we look at John, we'll see he's in this tail here at the end where he's got a really, really long credit history. It doesn't take too long before we realize that debugging was super important because this model has actually identified retirement age individuals based on their long credit histories and increased the risk of default for them. This is a big problem because age is a protected class. And so this is essentially found that credit history with a complicated model was able to pull out 
um, credit history and use it as a proxy for age. Okay. So it's really important to explain and debug your models. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about just one example of explainable AI in practice uh, and debugging and model exploration. Uh, but I'd like to highlight the fact that there are so many other ways to use these types of interpretability in your workflow. You can monitor models by explaining their error over time. You can encode prior beliefs about models uh, and then use explanations to actually control your model training process. You can talk about customer retention by supporting um, uh, call centers, uh, by explaining you know, why a churn model was done. Uh, we've, talked to, we've, we've applied this in decision support for medical settings. Uh, there's a lot of places where human risk oversight of machine learning models is enhanced with explanations. Uh, in regulatory compliance, uh, there's a lot of need for this type of transparency uh, for consumer explanations. Uh, it can help you better understand anti-discrimination, as we just showed an example of. Uh, and of course, risk management, where you're understanding what your model will do when economic conditions change, all the more important right now. Uh, and even in scientific discovery, you can find that explanations can help you better do population subtyping, uh, extremely helpful for pattern discovery, and even signal recovery of things inside things like DNA. Uh, all of these things are just tons of downstream applications of interpretable ML um, that's supported by these types of tools and research. And I hope that this insight has given you a bit of uh, taste and uh, uh, excitement for, for what can be done here. Thanks. Thank you.